see we have, um, we only have a few participants to attendees. Okay, um, I see that the attendees are growing. So we will wait for more people to come. Uh, Good do morning. You want, do you want me to make them participants? Yes. Oh, um, no, not, not, not today. Um, we'll see if, if they're happy to raise their hand later. So we, okay. we can, can do that because there might be a few more coming. Okay, so I see that they are. Uh, we are live on YouTube, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and let you guys take over. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, so students, you may all remember last time we had some technical difficult, uh, difficulties and I was quite unceremoniously kicked off. Um, hopefully that won't happen today, I am on campus. Um, but I do want to come back to the previous poem that we looked at. And that poem was, of course, Sometimes When It Rains. And um, you should have by now read through the poem. And hopefully you would have looked um, at that wonderful performance from Gina and Plope on this particular poem. So just to get the discussion going, um, I want us to, and, and, and this is an open-ended discussion, because I do want us to look at different aspects of the poem. And, and please um, feel free to share there. It doesn't seem like there's very many participants today. So please don't be intimidated to share. The wonderful thing with poetry is that um, your response can never be wrong if you substantiate it correctly. So just coming back to the poem and, and just to get started with this discussion around how we analyze poems, we have to look at different elements and we're going to be breaking down those elements for us. So firstly, the first question that I have, and you, and you should recognize some of these questions from um, the worksheet that we posted a few weeks ago, but I just wanted to tackle a few questions together and for you to be open to respond to them. So the first two questions that I have is, um, describe the change between the first three stanzas and stanza four and five. What do these stanzas reveal about what life was like for the poet slash narrator? And um, just at this point, when we are looking at the poem, the, the poet and narrator are interchangeable. We're going to be looking at another poem where we definitely see the poet and narrator are two different people because the poet is an adult and the narrator is a child. So I want us to also explore the voice. But how, what, how stanza four and five go? And I'm going to read it out. Um, if you are able to access the poem online, please get um, a copy of that. So the poem goes, stanza four goes, Sometimes when it rains, I think of times when we had to undress, carry the small bundles of uniforms and books on our heads and cross the river after school. Then stanza five, sometimes when it rains, I remember times when it would rain hard for hours and fill our drum so we didn't have to fetch water from the river for a day or two. Okay, so now if we just look at those two, because we aren't going to have time to go into stanzas one and three, what do what is revealed about the poet's life and circumstances? And at this point, she's obviously reflecting back on her childhood experiences. She doesn't say things directly, but definitely from the language that she's used, from what she's describing her experiences and memories, it tells us a lot about her childhood. So any um, students or perhaps any of the, the lecturers as well, if you want to um, respond. Okay, so Sanal, we, we have already a first comment. Uh, Sanal says the poet was living in a poor community. Okay, yes, definitely we can see that. Um, can we perhaps 
substantiate that a little bit further? What do we see from her circumstances? What is she describing? And also, if any of our lecturers um, want to you know, comment on this, uh, we also would love to hear from you. Sorry, I muted myself. Okay. Hi, Trevlin. Hi, Grace. Hi, Hi. Mary. Hi, students. Hey. So um, if you look at the uh, first three stanzas, sorry, I'm going to be looking at my screen. Oh, if you look at the first three stanzas, there's the sense that uh, she's very, the, the, the narrator is very happy and carefree. She, there's, um, she makes note of smiling and running in the rain. So there's also the sort of innocence. But then when you look at stanzas four and five, Yes, as the student just um, indicated now, you have the sense that she's in a poor community in a, in a sort of maybe rural area, because now they have to actually, if you look at it, they have to cross a river and they have to go and fetch water. So this is indicative of hardship. So that's just my comment, Trevlin. <laughs> definitely, thank you so much for that, um, Cami, and I would definitely agree. I think this, um, and it reminds me of those moments when we had those terrible rains and then schools were closed down for a while. And it, it reminds me of how dangerous this can be. And particularly when the um, narrator says, we had to undress and carry the small bundles of uniforms and books on our heads and cross the river after school. Okay, so this is very, it's a very dangerous activity. And it's also indicating how far she has to travel to get to school and to get home again. So there is the sense of danger in the rain. But then in the next stanza, she says, we didn't have to fetch river uh, water from the river for a day or two. So with that is some kind of innocent happiness. But once again, it tells us that she doesn't have running water at home. So definitely indicates a lot about her circumstances. So yes, thank you so much for that. Um, any other students, any comments that we have around this? Okay, don't worry, we, we will move on. There's, there will be plenty of time for us to reflect on specific areas. And please, as we are discussing things amongst ourselves, please feel free to jump in. We'd love to also hear from you. Um, and then the, the next question I have um, to ask is regarding, let's see when I'm going to scroll down my page. Okay, so what quality is the rain given in stanzas 9 to 10 that differs from the previous stanzas? Okay, so now we've looked at some of the previous stanzas. I'm going to read out stanzas 9 and 10. And I want you to be very specific about the word choices that the poet uses to paint a picture. In the other worksheet that I uploaded online, the words that the poet uses really does paint a kind of picture and it makes us feel a specific emotion. So I want you to think about why did she, why is she describing the rain like this and how, what are the changes that we see? So firstly, um, Stanza Nan goes, sometimes when it rains, rains so hard, Hail joins in. I think of life prisoners in all the jails of the world and wonder if they still love to see the rainbow at the end of the rain. In stanza 10, sometimes when it rains with hailstones biting the grass, I can't help thinking they look like teeth, many, many teeth of smiling friends then I wish that everyone else had something to smile about. Okay, and I really do love that um, end paragraph. It really ends on such a beautiful note. But I want you to look at, if we compare stanzas nine and stanzas 10, so stanza nine, obviously looking at, at life prisoners in the jails and all over the world, a very sort of sad tone there. But then in stanza 10, a happier tone, and, and she's using, um, you know, this very descriptive words. And I don't want, I want us to, to talk about that. What is she describing? What is she say, saying that the hail looks like? And why is that an effective description? 
do we have any comments on this? And really just remember that at this point, we are really just trying to explore and look at the language and how the language tells a story and communicates a message. What is that message? What is that story? What do we think? Okay, so we'll give our students a few minutes, but also if any of our you know, lecturers and panelists would like to, to share some of their insights, that would be wonderful as well. It's me again. <laughs> um, so when you look at um, stanza nine, yes. now, we, now we have things like hard hail instead of just mm. rain. And mm. we have prisoners and we have jails. So there's a sense of confinement in comparison to the running free, that carefree nature that she's had. I see a student has actually said something, Trevlin. Um, an anonymous attendee has said, we have different ways of how we interpret rain. And in stanza nine, she used a way of being rescued from the rain. Okay. Um, an interesting um, uh, comment, um, anonymous attendee. C could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Because um, rescued from the rain, um, do you think that that's maybe um, what the rain represents to prisoners in the world. Maybe the rainbow rep maybe represents hope and perhaps when it rains, they are able to see from the outside. Is, is, is that what you are referring to? That's a very interesting comment that. And if any of our other attendees want to comment on that, because she does look at confinement, but then she says, um, and wonder if they still love to see the rainbow at the end of the rain. And I think that that's a very powerful image. I'm sure we all love to see a rainbow and it really does you know, represent some, some hope. You go through hardships, but you come out um, very hopeful and there's you know, something beautiful to experience as with a rainbow. So any other students want to comment on that and perhaps comment um, on stanza 10? She talks now again about the hailstone Spotting the grass. Hi, Mary. Would you like Hi, to? Hi, everybody. Um, so I'd like to pick up on our students' lovely comment there. I agree that there is a sense of rescuing with that rain. And I think it goes to this idea of duality. The rain has a dual purpose. And we have that side of positive and negative coming through. And I really enjoy that image in the final stanza of biting. Because biting is quite an aggressive action. And yet that is turned around and it becomes the teeth that are smiling. And I think that's really important to see how we can take that negative and transform it into this beautiful imagery. Thank you so much, Mary. I actually, um, and I, that's why I love commenting on poetry because yes, something that is negative biting then actually becomes the smiling. And it, it, it is just so beautiful to this poem that has so many, um, mixed feelings. There's sadness, happiness, um, hope and confinement and all of these things come together and it's, you know, it's, you know, really tells us a lot about life and, and how it's about how we perceive and, and understand the situation. Thank you so much for that, Mary. Any other student, um, any other of our students want to comment on that, um, the final um, perhaps imagery of hail being like teeth and then she even describes the, um, the hail as being the many teeth of smiling friends. And then she ends obviously with it, then I wish that everyone else had something to smile about. Um, what is perhaps, um, I see that we have another comment here, anonymous attendee. When I said mess, rescued, I meant when it's raining, we normally stay indoors and she used prison to resonate with the rain. Yes, definitely. So as we can see here, thank you so much for sharing that anonymous attendee. It definitely looks at, you know, even somebody's in prison, they are still sheltered and there's still things for even them to be positive about and, and for them to experience the beauty of nature outside, perhaps when it rains. Okay, thank okay, you so can much. I just add, 
Oh, excellent, Grace. Hi. Yes, I would. We would. I'm yes. sure we'd love to. I would like to take you back a bit, uh, looking at stanza nine, um, looking at uh, the live prisoners, not necessarily referring to the people who are in jail, but live prisoners implying mm. that anybody can be having some life challenges. And after mm. they have the reins, um, then we also see the last uh, line here, which says to see the rainbow at the end of the rain. Now, after the heavy rains, sometimes the heavy rains come and destroy the plants. They mm. come and actually cause some land degradation. And after that, people don't actually get excitement out of it. Now, when we also look at uh, stanza 10, Sometimes when it rains with the hailstones biting the grass, grass naturally refer, uh, the greenish of it refers to life. So when rains come and destroy something that people um, live on or survive on, then it simply means it's biting their livelihood. Oh, lovely, thank you so much, Grace. I think that those are really um, worthwhile comments. And I'm hoping that students, what you are seeing here in all our different um, interpretations and different comments that we have, none of these are wrong. They are all correct in context and it depends on what we are drawing on. But it's very important that like we see here that you actually draw on examples to support what you are saying. So thank you so much colleagues, those are really wonderful points. And, um, we, when we get to this um, final question and then we move on to the next set of poems, please feel free that as we discuss some of these points, if any of the students watching live would like to comment, add on what we're trying to say, we really love to hear feedback from you. So please be encouraged to do that. Okay, let me just scroll down the page. Okay, here we go. So the final point that we have, and this is really the extension question. So we would like you to obviously do this, but I want you to look at how all of these different elements, and obviously we've touched on only a few elements today, and there's a lot more to look at when you unpack each of the stanzas and you look at all the imagery that she's used to create a tone or a feeling. But I want you to look at the poem as a whole. And then I want you to think about why do you believe in Plope? So Gina and Plope, our poet slash narrator, depending how we'd like to look at it, wrote this poem. Explain what you believe her overall message or agenda was. So I think that that's always with any kind of text, a short story, a, a novel, a poem, there is always a message that the poet is trying to convey. So I want us to always consider why, what is the message that she's trying to convey or communicate. So very important for us to consider the language, the imagery to consider, sorry about that, to consider um, the exploration of South African issues and to look at the use of poetic devices. Okay, I see we have a comment on our Q&A. Um, okay, an anonymous attendee um, says most people are happy after the rain because rain gives life to plants. In stanza seven, they might use smiles showing a way of how people, of how happy people are after the rain. Yes, and definitely I think that that's really beautiful. We know that water sustains life and you know in order for there to be greenery around and for there to be grass we need the rain so definitely the rain can be seen as something that gives life very good then um, another anonymous attendee says i may be wrong if i say that the rhythm is quicker paced because it doesn't have a lot of punctuation yes and that's well that's interesting because there are some instances where there is punctuation but other instances where there isn't punctuation and what you are saying there is that the one idea flows onto the other so yes there is definitely this um continuum in the poem there's we're looking at the poem as a whole and there's sometimes not a lot of pauses or full stops it's as if the thought is continuing so yes i think um anonymous attendee thank you for um that and also, I think um, it's always um, when you start with, I may be wrong, you know, you're never wrong if it's 
only you are only wrong if you are unable to justify your position. So you justified it quite well. Um, and then obviously it's it's important to to ex expand on these ideas. So thank you so much for that comment, anonymous attendee. Any other points that anybody would like to add about this before we go into the next set of poems? So let's anything about perhaps what about the exploration of South African issues, use of poetic devices? Anybody else want to have a final comment on this poem? on the imagery that's used, on the language that's used, before we go, go into the other, looking at the other two poems that we're gonna be focusing on today. Anyone? Let's see if we have any comments. Okay, so that's fine. I think let's, um, what I'd like you to do is what we modeled today, this discussion that we had, um, and that's why it's very important for us to share our responses um, on the online forums, because as you can see, what, we, what we're doing here and, and what we're kind of modeling is um, how it's a good idea to have discussions and to build on one another's ideas. We all see the world very differently and we thus interpret poems very differently, but everybody has a little bit of con uh, to contribute to the grander picture to, to the larger story of a poem. And it's important for us to have these discussions and to build on one another's responses. So obviously we're gonna start the process today, but we really would encourage you to, on these online forums, build on one another's ideas, share your perspectives and, and be um, open to do so. You are never incorrect. Like I say, you, it's only incorrect if you are unable to justify and substantiate your response. Okay, so I'm going to open up the next set of questions for today. Can everyone see EFI online lecture 23rd of June? Yes, Kevin. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, okay, so I did obviously post this um, early this morning for you to look at, but I am mindful of the fact that some of you might have not looked through the poems. What we are going to do, so I'm going to read out the question and I want you to reflect on this and then I'm going to read out the poem. So the question goes, read the poem on the following page titled Dream and Dream and Dream by Dana Smith and then briefly explain the theme, message or meaning of the poem below. And then in order to determine the message or feeling, consider the words the poet uses. Think carefully about the poet's phrasing and wording. And then think carefully about how these words make you feel and how this relates to her overall statement or message. So you can refer to line numbers in your responses. And really what we are looking at here is how language is used to convey a specific emotion or message. Like we've already said, every um, text that an author or poet creates, there is a message behind it. And it's very important for us to look at the language and look at the ideas and how those are conveyed in order for us to read with the poet. Okay, see so we have a question here. Okay, so this is back to um, the previous poems, um, the anonymous attendee says, I think she used to live in a rural settlement, like when she mentioned sheep, goats, and the river. Yes, exactly. I think that is um, what you've done there is you've said, this is where I think she lives and you've supported it and justified your response um, with specific evidence from the poem. So thank you so much, anonymous attendee. We would definitely agree with that. Okay, so now coming to this dream and dream. Okay, so I'm going to read through the poem. I do have the poem below here so you can follow it as well. And we'll go through all of these questions. And please um, don't worry if we don't get to finish it, you can go reflect on this yourself. There will be um, spaces for you to share your responses, but let's just consider the poem as a whole. So the poem goes, I'll dream and dream and dream. I'll dream until my soul awakes and it's time for youth to part. I'll dream until my passion breaks and this child's abandoned heart. I'll dream a lost and former friend, the innocence I've held so tight. Before the colors blur and bend, 
I'll dream of who I was tonight. Before my tears drip down and dry, I'll dream with colors pure and gold. Before the innocence inside me dies and childhood is hard and cold. I'll dream as if absorbed in youth, illusion moonlight, showering light, blind to pain and awful truth. I'll dream of who I was tonight. Okay, so a lot of hard-hitting emotions in that poem that I'm sure a lot of us can relate to, but I want us to come back to the initial question about looking at the language that she is she uses the phrasing the wording the description and um obviously a similar theme um, emerges here about childhood and um what do we think about this poem what do we think the tone or statement or message is um, and whenever we are looking at this i think it's really important for us to first consider the tone and it's as simple as saying is this a happy poem is this a sad poem and then sometimes you might say it might be a little bit of both, depending on how you look at it. But what do we think? So any comments that we have from students about message and feeling, considering the words, the phrasing. And then also, once again, if any of our lecturers wants to comment on anything. Okay, so let me start the discussion. Um, so I wanna look at the first stanza that goes, I'll dream until my soul awakes and it's time for youth to part. I'll dream until my passion breaks and this child's abandoned heart. So what I think of when I read this poem is an adult thinking back to their childhood. And we know that a lot of the times childhood um, is about innocence and sometimes where the innocence comes in is that we don't have full understanding of the world, we can just appreciate um, the beauty of, you know, things that are immediately in front of us, we don't have um, awareness yet, so there is the sense of you know, children are just, just happy in being in the moment. And when she looks back and she's, she's speaking back with, you know, sadness, she talks about a former friend, the innocence I've held so tight. And she speaks about, I'll dream of who I was tonight. And then she even goes on to mention, before the innocence inside me died, dies, sorry, and childhood is hard and cold. It's this whole sense of now she's perhaps in a very sad space, maybe a very lonely space, maybe a very dark space. And she's looking back to her childhood. And it seems like she remembers this as being a very beautiful period of innocence. Is there any of our students that would like to pick up on this idea of, or do you maybe perceive it very differently? Because you might interpret the poem as her focusing on something else what do we think and once again coming back to this you know is looking at the theme of of childhood and, and, and childhood experiences and she's now perhaps I would say she's an adult reflecting back on her childhood as this innocent happy period and perhaps she might not be happy um, in this present moment in time so anything else that anyone wants to add on about this poem? And we are going to then look at another poem which has a very you know, different tone and feeling. Okay, let me just quickly uh, say that I, I explained it the way you have explained it, that Wonderful. it is somebody who is actually reflecting on the childhood memories mm -hmm. and saying mm -hmm. that cannot stop dreaming, cannot stop thinking about the memories of childhood. And, but when I looked at uh, line eight, I would dream a lost and former friend. I looked at the former friend as childhood. Ah, oh, beautiful, yes. you see, so, so I, you know, thought of that as just maybe a childhood friend, but perhaps it's, you know, like you say, her own childhood. Yes, and there's just so many ways you can, um, understand the poem and I think sometimes it really helps to read the poem out loud and we can really allow it to sink in and, and, and take the time to pause on specific ideas. 
Um, Cami, would you like to say something? Yes, I'm just, um, I'm looking at the chat. Um, All right, wanna, excellent. Is it possible to show the poem again on the screen? Um, a okay, one. yes. But I, I do have to do that as well. Just a reminder, you do have access to these poems online, but it's fine, I'm happy to share it. Okay, let me actually go, I want to show the first three lines. So here's the poem. I find, Trevlin and Grace, uh, your interpretations of the poem, it's, it's quite interesting because I had a completely different interpretation. For me, Isn't it's almost okay. as if um, she's on, uh, the, this, the poet is on the brink of uh, adulthood and is sort of scared about what's to come. So that's the way I'm seeing it. So not as someone who's reflecting backwards, but who's reflecting what life is going to be like going forward. So it's very interesting how things are open to interpretation like that. Definitely. And I, and I think that that's always the beauty of poetry is we can see, you know, everyone has a different response and everyone will um, interpret the narrative style very differently. Okay, so um, any students have any comments on this before we move to the next poem? Okay, well, let's, let me move to the next poem because we are, there is a question where you are asked to compare and contrast the poems. Okay, so now I want you to explore. So this is our guiding questions for every time I climb a tree. Is, um, sorry, I keep going past it. It says, how is the experience of childhood explored in every time I climb a tree? So in order to respond to this question, consider the narrator's actions and his or her personal feelings around these actions. Okay, so just a um, reminder at this point that the narrative voice, the narrator is not necessarily the, the, the poet. The poet, a lot of the times can write in a specific narrative voice. So when we do read through this poem, um, uh, David McCord, I think that's his name. Yes, David McCord isn't necessarily, we could say maybe he's reflecting on his childhood, that might be a, a response, but he's using um, a childlike voice and that comes through very strongly in the poem. So it's very important for us to look at the words of the poem, consider, and, and why I say consider the actions of what the narrator is doing and consider what is being repeated. There's a lot of repetition in this poem and why is there repetition and what that might particular what that might mean. Okay, so here we have the poem, Every Time I Climb a Tree. Okay, so it's quite a long poem. So it goes, every time I climb a tree, every time I climb a tree, every time I climb a tree. I scrape a leg or skin a knee. And every time I climb a tree, I find some ants or dodge a bee and get the ants all over me. And every time I climb a tree, where have you been? They say to me, but don't they know that I am free every time I climb a tree? I like it best to spot a nest that has an egg or maybe three. And then I skin the other leg but every time I climb a tree, I see a lot of things to see. Swallows, rooftops, and TV, and all the fields and farms there be. Every time I climb a tree, though climbing may be good for ants, it isn't awfully good for pants, but still it's pretty good for me every time I climb a tree. Okay, so what do we think about this? So let's first start with the... Um, question that should be in everyone's mind of who is this character this the, the narrative voice who is being described if we can um define this person before we go into to the language of the poem who is the i it says i i i and remember it's not david mccord he's using a narrative voice so what narrative voice might that be and yes, we could say he's maybe reflecting on his childhood experiences, perhaps. But who do we think? What comes to mind? Is this who is this character that's telling us this their um, adventures of climbing trees? I yeah, see we have a question. Okay, a young boy. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Yes, so I think um, I always. Uh, 
it's so interesting about this poem. I always think of a, a young little boy who is exploring. And then, um, you know, whenever I encounter this with students, they say, well, why does it have to be a boy? Can girls not climb trees and have adventures? And I say, actually, of course they can. But there is this, I don't know why we do have a sense that it might be a little boy, but definitely a young child. And there is this, um, so what do we know about this child? What does what does this poem convey or communicate about this child's personality, about this child's characteristics? What adjectives would be used to describe this child? And then um, look at the repetitive action of climbing a tree, and it is obviously repeated again and again. What does this indicate? And why do you think the poet ch chose to repeat this? And what does this action represent to the child this you know the verb of climbing what does this represent to the child do we have any okay yeah we have a question and answers so Samel says he likes climbing trees he feels free when he can climb a tree Yes, and um, that freedom definitely comes through. There is this, this sense of happiness and, and celebration in a poem. And um, it always reminds me, um, you know, of my childhood because I used to enjoy climbing trees. And I think for me, if I reflect back on my childhood, why I like to climb a tree is because you see the world from a new perspective. You are little, you are small, but now when you climb a tree, you are taller. You can see a lot that's around you. And we see that. And it's this action of climbing the tree. He can see everything that's around him. And I just love that one line where he says, I can see swallows, rooftops, and TV. Because I do think sometimes children tend to just stay inside and want to watch TV. But here we are seeing a child who's exploring the world around him and he's looking at the TV that's inside. So a very different, you know, child. Then anonymous attendee says, um, okay, so that every time um, I climb a tree, he chooses to repeat the words to show emphasis. Yes. And also I think this, what's being emphasized is the fact that the child's not just climbing the tree once. The child is climbing the tree, you know, several times. He's he's going up, he's going down, he's going up, he's going down. And um, I also just love um, the imagery of him, you know, he's scraping his knee. And I think sometimes if we look at that out of the context of a poem, we might say, oh, the child's very sad to scrape a knee, the child will be hurt. But we see that he continues. It's almost as if um, this is the battle scars from his adventures. And he scrapes the other leg, but he's still feeling a sense of freedom and um, exploring. And then there's um, that line, and I just love the line. He says, where have you been, they say to me. Who is the they? And at this point, when he says, but don't they know that I am free? So who is the they? And why is it that he feels like they don't understand him? Anyone have any um, insights about who they might be? Where have you been, they say to me, here in lines 12 and 13. Who is the they, do we think? Okay, so Sunal says, can be his mother and father. Yes, definitely. I do would agree that I would say that I think that that's their par parents. And I think there is this idea of parents want to know where their children are because they want them obviously to be safe and not be hurt, but he feels the sense that they don't understand him. Okay, so another um, Tabasile says parents maybe, anonymous attendee says they could be the people around him or her. Yes, so maybe not necessarily just the parents, but somebody perhaps asking where um, the child is. And there is the sense of perhaps you know, you know, parents asking these questions of where a child is are coming from a loving place. But for him, he just wants to explore. And I think a lot of the times in children's poetry, we do sense this um, separation from adults and um, adulthood and childhood. And, you know, childhood is really, uh, well, maybe not necessarily in other poems, but particularly in this poem, childhood is um, shown as being very exciting and you know it's this whole idea that parents should encourage children 
to explore but obviously you know within the boundaries because he's obviously got a tree that he likes to climb and it's a tree so it's perhaps um, a specific tree that he enjoys climbing okay great thanks um thank you so much for your um responses let's go back to the garden questions oh we have some more questions here and answers i think um went away okay, sorry i'm just getting it so okay no sorry we have already addressed all of those questions don't worry um so let's go back to the garden questions and i want you to think of so we've now had quite a good discussion of both poems and I want you now to um, compare and contrast the tone and feeling of the two poems. Whenever we're looking at the tone of a poem, we're looking at feelings, emotions and mood. And in order for us to respond to this kind of questions, question, we need to look at each poem. So first thing we need to look at, what is the tone? What is the feeling, emotional mood? How can we say that this is the feeling, emotional mood? Very important for us to look at imagery that's used, to look at the language that's used, to look at the poetic devices. And I want you to compare and contrast. So whenever we comparing and contrasting, we think, are there similar aspects? So there might be similar themes, perhaps, maybe not. Um, do we see any similar uh, similarities between the poems or do we see the poems as being very different? Okay, and then we're not going to have time, but there are a lot of garden questions that I have um, for you to complete on your own as your own independent work. And then what we want you to do is try, you know, respond to each of these garden questions in a paragraph and then see, can this paragraph be used to create an essay or be the starting point for an essay. But before we get to those, let's just look at the poem holistically, the two poems holistically. There's every time I climbed a tree and then there's dream and dream and dream. What do we think are, what's different between the poems? Are there any similarities? I see, um, I think there is there some responses in the chat. Hi, Trevlin, we out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We are, it's fine, we are out of time. But um, please be reminded to, so what we did today where we're building on one another's ideas, please we'd like you to encourage that, to encourage you to do that on, on your online platforms. And um, for you to then respond to this, these independ this independently, and then feel free to share responses with one another and to build on one another's responses on these online platforms. Okay. Thank you so much to all for all the participation today. Thank you so much to my colleagues. It was wonderful um, reading through poetry with you. It's always fun. So thank you so much, everybody, and um, looking forward to seeing some interesting